welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In previous lectures, we've talked about the process whereby the United States became entangled in Vietnam in the early to mid-1960s, particularly during the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. In this lecture, we'll continue that discussion, now with the United States being fully involved in the war in Vietnam, in this series of lectures titled Into the Abyss. Sending American ground forces to Vietnam led quickly to increased escalation of the war, as George Ball and others had predicted. The Viet Cong were gaining in power. Americans were not safe walking even a few minutes outside of the major cities and military bases. The Arvin, meantime, were in a precipitous decline. Morale was low. Desertion rates and absenteeism were high. Officers were corrupt and disinterested. By 1965, in an army numbering about 500,000, the Arvin desertion rate was estimated at 11,000 per month. Also, Political instability continued. The year of coups was over, but the country was led by a leadership committee of ten that did little to appeal to the South Vietnamese population. The two most significant members of the group were Win Cao Khe and Win Van Thu. Khe had served with the French against the Viet Minh and risen through the ranks of the Republic of Vietnam military. In the 60s, he was chief of the Arvin Air Force. Kay was able to prevail in a series of coups, often by sending fighters in the air and threatening to level his opponents. He was wildly unpredictable and usually got his way. He liked the European influence of the French and was considered something of a dandy. He wore two pearl-handled revolvers, jumpsuits, and scarves. He liked to imitate John Wayne. William Bundy said of Kay, It seemed to all of us the bottom of the barrel, absolutely the bottom of the barrel. The chairman of the committee was Win Van Thu, a commander in the Arvin. He was more conservative and cautious than Kay. He seemed a better choice around which to build a successful political coalition but neither remotely approached the popularity of Ho Chi Minh, and both struggled with lack of unity in South Vietnam. With the Viet Cong strengthening, the Arvin seemingly falling apart and no real political stability, Lyndon Johnson had to confront the possibility that the South Vietnamese government would fail without further American involvement. As if to confirm his fears, on March 30, 1965, a car bomb exploded outside the American embassy in Saigon, wounding 52 Americans, killed 20, and wounded 130 Vietnamese. Johnson was determined not to lose Vietnam, so he authorized more troops and escalation of American military activity. By the end of 1965, American troop levels numbered 184,000. In 1966, it was 389,000. In 1967, 463,000. 1968, 495,000. And 1969, 541,000, before the numbers finally start to come down. In May of 1965, Johnson authorized Operation Mayflower a suspension of bombing to give Ho Chi Minh an opportunity to negotiate for peace. Ho Chi Minh insisted that peace would only come when all American troops left South Vietnam and the National Liberation Front was allowed to participate fully in the government in South Vietnam. Johnson, of course, would not agree, and he would only pursue peace when all North Vietnamese troops withdrew from the South and with no involvement of the NLF in southern politics. Within a week, the bombings resumed. With no sign of peace, Johnson had to decide how to proceed with the military operations. He settled on what was called the Enclave Strategy, which seemed a reasonable compromise between purely defensive operations and an all-out attack. In this strategy, American forces would be concentrated around coastal enclaves, 
major cities and population centers near the coast in South Vietnam. From those centers, American troops would launch patrols up to a 50-mile radius. Essentially, they ignored the highlands and inland areas where they were thinly populated. They concentrated on securing positions near the coast. It is also at this time that the Congress approved an additional $700 million for troops, which Lyndon Johnson used as proof that the nation and Congress supported the war, and I mentioned this in the previous lecture. Also during this time, Johnson attempted to assemble an international coalition to help with the fighting, but this was largely unsuccessful. Britain and France believed the United States was getting into a very bad situation and urged some sort of settlement. In the end, only Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, and South Korea sent small numbers of troops to assist. Otherwise, this was America's war. In the meantime, Westmoreland continued to seek more troops and more freedom in his actions. He didn't particularly like the Enclave strategy, and was concerned with the growing strength of the enemy in areas that they were not attacking. Johnson was frustrated and somewhat confused. He would later write of this period, quote, The situation had reached the desperate point. We had tried everything to get to the peace table from November 1963 to 1965, and we had not succeeded, and we either had to run in or run out. And that last phrase is a very famous quote from this period. Johnson assembled opinions from other experts as well. Robert McNamara urged him to listen to Westmoreland and the generals. Short of nuclear weapons, the most promising way to some kind of exit strategy was to bring every ounce of American firepower into play. There was still hope for a quick victory while the Viet Cong was still relatively weak, but those hopes faded by the day. Johnson also sought the advice of the so-called wise men, a group of elder statesmen reaching back to the presidencies of Kennedy and even Eisenhower, and in some cases even Truman. Most of them agreed that the Vietnam situation had reached a point of no return. There was no withdrawal at this point. They had to press on and tried to achieve victory. In May and June of 1965, Johnson authorized the escalation in the number of bombing sorties and also sent another 150,000 troops, and he authorized Westmoreland to abandon the Enclave strategy. In our next lecture, we'll continue to look at America's process of sliding into the abyss and the challenges confronted by American soldiers as they arrived in Vietnam.